I don't know exactly what paths A, B, and C look like because we don't have the pictures, but they probably look something like this. Yeah. Okay, so now we should solve the problem. We won't get the exact right answers because I don't know whether their path A was bending up or down, but we'll see how to do the problem. So, um, what would we do now? So the force in A is up. True. And then, might have gotten a little confused there. So by, by the fact that there was a change, let's just focus on the particle at this point. Let's focus on the particle at this point. At this point, what's the direction of the velocity vector? Up, down, left, right, northeast, uh, southwest. Uh, uh, right. Which one is it? To the right. How do you know? Remember back from the first semester, the velocity is always tangent to the path. Oh, yeah. The velocity is always tangent to the path. Well, when the particles originally left the sample, the path was going straight to the right in all four cases. It didn't start bending until it had been exposed to the field for a while. Originally, these were each going straight to the right until they started bending. So at the original point here, when the particle first emerged, its velocity was to the right. We're just going to end up confusing ourselves if we try to focus on the velocity over here. If we can just focus on the initial point when it first emerged from the sample, we'll be in better shape. Now, now that we know this is V, now we have to figure out what the direction of the force is. And that doesn't come from the right-hand rule. We can see that just from looking at the picture. At this point here, what direction is the force in? Up. Yeah, straight up. His, the force is causing a change in direction over here. The force here is pointing straight up, and that's what's causing the path to start curving like this. The reason why this path starts curving upwards is because of this initial force in the upwards direction. Mm -hmm. The analysis would be more complicated if we focused on the point further along the path, but we can just focus on this point uh, at the original start of the path when we just started curving. And now we should have enough information to apply the same techniques we did last time. So, so try again. Your thumb goes up, your palm goes up. Now, what we want to do here is apply the same approach that we did for the problems we had on the, the board a second ago. I think you might have forgotten a little bit how we were just doing those previous problems. Now, the key thing here is when you use the right-hand rule, you know two of these things. Uh -huh. And then you use the right-hand rule to tell you the third one. So you're, not, you're only supposed to adjust your hand to be in accord with two of these things. So which of these things do we know from this path? F and B. We know we these know two. B Pardon? Don't we do, but that doesn't help us, or that's not relevant because the fingers don't point in the direction of V. The fingers point in the direction of QV, and we don't know what Q is. In fact, that's what the problem is really trying to get us to figure out. The problem is trying to get us to figure out what Q is. So we don't know this because we don't know QV. However, you can use the right-hand rule to figure this out. This is the sub-question. Once we put our fingers in the right direction for V and F, the right-hand rule will tell us what QV is. So what is the direction of QV here? Let's see if we can confirm that. So our palm should be pointing in the direction of the field, which is out of the, out of the page. And our thumb should be pointing in the direction of the force, which is up. And then when the palm is pointing out of the page and the thumb is up, our fingers, which represent QV, are pointing to the left. Uh -huh. Also, it's negative. That's right. That was that same trick we were using on those previous problems. The same trick we were using on the previous problems. If V and QV are pointing in opposite directions, we know that Q is negative. So then which is the correct choice for path A? B minus. How do you know it can't be alpha decay? Because alpha decay is positive. Yeah, that was the point of all that review we did earlier. Remember we saw that alpha particles had a positive yeah. 2 charge. And how do you know it can't be beta plus? Because it has a positive. Yeah, because those have a positive charge too. And gamma has 0. Right, uh-oh, it looks like we'll need even a little more help here though. 
So, and then gamma has uh, zero charge. That's right. So by the way, how would, a, how would a gamma particle bend in a magnetic field? What would be the direction of the force on the gamma particle? It's kind of a trick question. That's right. Do you remember what the, the formula is for magnetic force? Remember this formula, QVB sine theta. So what's the magnetic force on something with no charge? Zero. That's right. So you wouldn't even use the right hand rule for a gamma particle. The right hand rule is only when the magnetic force really exists. If something has no charge, it's not going to feel any magnetic force. If something has no charge, it's not going to feel any magnetic force. OK, so anyway, we decided that Q was negative here. Yeah. OK, and then the only thing in the list that's negative is the beta minus decay. Right. Right. So we decided this must be beta minus decay. All right, that was fun. Two more to go. So. The force on B is just to the right? Because it's moving to the right? Mm -hmm. Now remember that forces don't cause motion, they cause changes in motion. Oh, so there's no force? That's right. As far as we can tell, there's no force. As far as we can tell, there's no force. We knew there was a force here because remember Newton's first law back from the very beginning of the course, an object in motion it tends to continue in motion in a straight line. It doesn't need a force. However, if something is bending, there must be a force that's causing the path to bend. So if there's no force, how do you do the right hand rule? We can't. Oh. But what does it tell us if, there, if there's no force? What does that tell us about the particle? What type of particle would not feel any force? Oh, uh, a gamma? That's right. That's the idea we were talking about a second ago. Would, would beta particles feel a force? Yes, because they have a charge. Would add Alpha particles feel a force, yes, because they have a charge, but gamma particles would feel no force because they have no charge. So this is where it's very important to have done all that work we did earlier about figuring out what the charge is on each of the different types of particles and knowing that photons have no charge. So there's no force here. So what's the charge? Um, zero. Right. And here we didn't use the right hand rule. We used the formula for magnetic force. If there's zero force and the object is moving in the magnetic field, it seems like the reason for that would be zero charge. So we decided that path B was coming from a gamma particle? Yep. OK. So for C, the force is down. Right. And the B is out. So Q, B is to the right. And then this goes to the right, so it's a positive. Let's confirm that. The palm is still facing out of the page for B. Now, this is curving down, so the force must be down. So uh, my thumb should be down. Whoops. Yeah. My palm is out of the page, and the force is down. And then my fingers for QB are pointing to the right. Yeah. And that's what you said. So QB is to the right. And what did you deduce from that about Q? Positive. OK. But it could be alpha or, so is it a type of decay cannot be Oh, yeah, I didn't notice that choice there. That's right. So it's a little bit hard to tell because they have both alpha and beta plus. However, I think there probably is a way to tell the difference between them here. I don't think that's the right answer. Oh, okay. So we're saying it could either be beta plus or alpha. Or alpha. That's right. Remind me, what, what were the, the numbers for beta plus and alpha? Beta plus is 0 and 1. Oh, yeah. Oh, may maybe this is harder than I thought. Um, and alpha is 4 and 2. Now we know that when we put these particles in a magnetic field, they're going to bend because they're going to feel a force. Mm -hmm.
let's say something has a very big mass. Would it bend a lot or only a little? A lot. Well, actually, let's think about that. A little. Wait, wait, why a little? Because it's big. It's got a lot of inertia. Remember that the inertia would tend to carry it in a straight line. Yeah. Inertia tends to make things move in a straight line. It takes a force to push you out of that straight line. So if you have a big mass, you have a lot of inertia, and your path is only going to bend a little. Something with a big mass, it's difficult to bend it out of its straight line path. Whereas if something has a small mass, would that bend a lot or a little? If the force was the same, even a little force would have a great big impact on a small mass.